architecture school, is it worth it? It's a question I get a lot, and I've been thinking about it for the last 20, 25 years. That's when uh, I decided to go to Cornell for undergraduate, and I eventually stayed on for graduate school. So obviously, this is like a very personal question. So I'm going to try to separate both my answers at the time, along with the experiences I've gained along the way to hopefully break it down to a bunch of ideas that hopefully some of you that are wrestling with the same question will find useful because what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for anyone else. And if anyone tells you that the answer to a question like this is yes or no, please do not listen to them. It's way more complex than that. So I think in general, context really matters. So for me, uh, I was a suburban kid from just north of Santa Barbara, so not the most like urban or exciting environment. Neither one of my parents uh, attended university, so there wasn't like a lot of pressure or pushing towards this. And it was like a pretty mundane experience growing up where there wasn't a lot of international travel or we weren't these like super cultured, sophisticated, thoughtful, arti like artistic uh, metropolitan people. So for me, that was one of the initial things that intrigued me about architecture school. It just seemed like a way to see and think and engage in part of the world that was very different from the strip malls and suburban ranch houses where I grew up. So I did think about a lot at the time was sort of the cost versus the financial part. And financial stability was definitely one of my goals. But it wasn't the only one. I had also gotten accepted at the same time that I got accepted to Cornell's undergraduate program. I got accepted to University of Southern California, USC's uh, undergraduate sort of business program. And so I was sort of like debating between these two things. And the way I sort of looked at it was, is sure, financial stability was one of my goals. Like I wanted to, you know, do better than my parents and have some opportunity in life. I wasn't like super eager to make like millions of dollars or be incredibly rich. I just thought it'd be cool to make a good living, be able to do a few things that you want and really like what you're doing. And so there was other goals as well. And I would kind of, I think at the time, I sort of thought of them as creative fulfillment, right? The ability to kind of have some signature personality to what you're doing. And that definitely weighed in favor of an architecture program versus a business program. Although in retrospect, I think you can do business in a way that is also uh, creatively fulfilling and it also has a personal signature on it. But architecture felt like the physical product that comes out of your work would have like your a little bit of your creative DNA in it. And that was appealing. Another aspect was social respect. It seemed to me, not knowing a lot of architects, but it seemed like they were like generally well-respected people in society. They're often in like movies, they're cast as like the, the male sort of love interest, but like very generically, because it's just like, it's someone that's like professional. So it seems like they kind of have their stuff together, but not quite as like mercenary as a lawyer and a little more creative than a doctor. And I think those are actually good comps because they're all sort of regulated professions that involve taking tests and being certified uh, in the professional practice of them. Architecture just had this nice mix of being the creative version of a professional service provider. And so I thought like, oh, yeah, you know, if I if I became an architect, I think I would have like a decent place in whatever uh, social fabric I ended up in in whatever city I ended up living in. The last sort of part was. I think at the time I thought of it as fun, um, but now I sort of think of, you know, because fun is kind of hard to, to quantify, I kind of think of it more as ease of motivation. And that's kind of how I judge how much fun I'm having at work is, is it easy to stay motivated? And I felt like with architecture, even if I had some success, it would still be easy to be excited about the next one Whereas I had always kind of thought that financially, once I hit a certain level, I would lose financial motivation. And that's kind of played out to be mostly true. I've never just had this uh, insatiable desire for more, more, more uh, higher numbers on the board. So it was kind of those four things, the financial stability, which, you know, I think probably the upside for the business uh, degree probably would have been higher. Um, the creative fulfillment. That was like pretty spot on. The social respect, 
mm, I think it just depends on who you're talking to. Different people sort of uh, uh, have different amount of respects for creatives. But in general, like, you know, being an architect or professional designer is like pretty cool. It's never something you're like embarrassed of saying at a party. And the ease of motivation, I think that's been like the the kind of home run and kind of true to what I was sort of predicting at that time is my design career has been a series of creative adventures that have been, as soon as I do one, I'm, I mean, sometimes a little exhausted if I was really pushing hard on a deadline, but most of the time I kind of am excited to start the next one and do a few things differently or evolve on the last one or even take things in a totally different direction. So those are sort of the four buckets that I was thinking of. The, the other thing I think is important to consider is I think a lot of people that I've heard that have asked me this question and then they sort of follow it up with, well, I mean, is it really worth it to get an architecture degree? I mean, can't I just learn it on YouTube or can't I just learn it on Reddit or can't I just like learn to draw, use the software and design my own buildings? Yeah, I think in terms of like specific information of how to use CAD programs or how to make renderings or even what building code is. Or even how to build a building. You can apprentice for a contractor. You can do software tutorials. You can read building code after you download it. And you can go to the library and get an unending amount of architectural books. So I don't think the specific information was that valuable. What I thought was in totally valuable for me was, and I was someone that kind of leans towards self-taught in general when it comes to specifics. But for me, the valuable part is, For Cornell's undergrad, there was 70, about 70 kids in my class. They're from all over the world, all over the U.S. Um, And it was this dynamic, immersive environment that was competitive. It was fun. It was silly. It was inspiring. And it would kind of be like, like it'd be hard to learn to be good at basketball by just doing shooting drills and then like reading books on fundamentals. There is a sort of dynamic to sort of play and interaction and competition and that's sort of beyond the specifics of the classroom. And I think the way the different students all sort of pushed each other, challenged each other, made fun of each other and generally sort of valued each other, not just on sort of like the typical student things like, oh, how cool you are or what you look like or sort of who throws the best parties. There was like pretty intense respect, especially in the studio courses, on who was actually good at doing the doing the work. Now, the way the sort of uh, undergrad sort of program shapes out is you have these sort of six unit studio classes, and that's fairly typical, uh, particularly of five year undergraduate programs. There's also four years, but you can look that up on your own about the different uh, the different four versus five year undergraduate programs, um, but. There's a six unit studio classes, so it's worth twice the sort of units or credits that a typical class is. And that is like a 30 to 40 hour a week class. And then you spend another like 10 to 15, maybe even sometimes like 20 hours on other sort of coursework, or at least that's how my sort of time was broken down. Now, I could have gotten away with probably studio and got passing grades with probably like 15 to 20, but it was fun and there was an ease of motivation to put into that additional work. And it was the first time that I really felt that schoolwork had a sort of a personality to it, that the work I was producing was not just filling out assignments, it was actually connected to the uniqueness of the way I thought and felt about the world. And so that made it pretty easy to be motivated and then also seeing that everyone else in the studio, at least about 70, 80% were putting in those kind of hours, that kind of created this kind of, uh, we're all in this together, let's all race for these next reviews. So I think that environment of the students was the part that often gets missed when people try to break an educational program down into, you know, what specific knowledge you, you learned that could just be pulled from a book. So... The lectures and the professors were great. They were great as a way to kind of test yourself. And at the architecture program I was at, every one of the students was kind of like the best student in their high school art classes. And I think the most fun part is everyone had been used to getting praise, being like, wow, your paintings are so good. Wow, your your drawings are, are good. 
So you took a bunch of like kids that were like all stars in the creative classes at their high school and now they're all together and there's less of a differentiation and no one's sort of special because they can draw really well freehand. I mean, there were some exceptional people that stood out even on that level, but, and then the faculty were kind of like challenging. And so a lot of students really didn't respond well to the first time they got kind of <laughs> scathing criticism about the work they sort of presented. But I was kind of like, oh, this is great. I mean, I can't just do something and people say it's good. It was a real nice sort of pushback. So I think that leads to sort of temperament sort of questions that are very different for different people. Um, I think from what I understand, having been in academia as a faculty member teaching architecture afterwards and just in the general trend of things, I think schools have gotten a little less harsh in the criticism, but from, it's still a big part of our uh, architectural education today. And from when I was there, a lot of the harshness wasn't necessary, even though I liked a, a good portion of it. It could have probably been just as effective at getting the information across uh, uh, and toning it down, just a notch of spiciness. But yeah, I think that that kind of first pushback on sort of presenting your ideas and having somebody say, okay, I see what you're trying to say. Explain to me why this is good, why this is worthwhile. Why would these ideas that you've articulated what they are, why would someone want to commit resources, time, money, and building materials to making this happen. And that kind of challenge to explain why you wanted to do something instead of just what you wanted to do, I think was the sort of critical uh, challenge. The other thing that I think is underrated about an ar architectural education is the frequency of which you actually present in front of your peers and faculty. And with studio classes in particular, you're pinning up within your sort of little section, which might be 10 other students, you have your, in, within the 70 uh, kids in studio, there's kind of separated into six or seven sections for at least the, uh, my program. And so you have your kind of teaching assistant or your sort of uh, studio leader. Um, in first year, it was a graduate student or a teaching assistant. And then, you know, second year was an actual uh, faculty member. So you have this kind of small group that you're meeting with on a daily basis and you pin up to that group. And then you know, a couple times a semester, you the whole studio of all 70 kids gets together and you're presenting often in front of, you know, 30 to up to the, the whole class. And also these presentations are often public, meaning that kids from upper years can walk into your presentation and you're standing there somewhat sleep deprived in front of all your drawings pinned up and you have a review. And so the... It was the first time for me, and I'd done pretty well in high school, where I wasn't just creating some work and handing it in or getting some review from the teacher. It was standing up in front of work that you were worked really hard on and having to get, you know, public criticism in in front of your classmates, the your friends, your your mortal nemesis, uh, the, the the kids that you couldn't stand that were rooting for you to get torn apart, um, the girl you had a crush on, and all that kind of stuff. So, I thought that part was actually great. I had been pretty reluctant to speak in public before, and was definitely confident, but a little bit on the shy side. And I think five years of standing up and learning how to work to hard towards something and then stand in front of that work and present it on a regular basis. One, it toughened me up for social media where I'd been like, man, I've gotten a lot of, <laughs> I've gotten mean comments from people that were at the top of their profession and the profession I was trying to do uh, right in my face from four feet away. So getting the occasional mean comment was, I think, a little bit easier after that. But no, I think that that lends itself well towards non-architectural things that I ended up doing. So I've raised money for three projects so far in my career, one for a tech startup um, and then a couple times for real estate projects. And in terms of raising money and pitching an idea and getting people to invest into that idea, I'm three for three. And I think that ability of constantly presenting 
to, in harsh circumstances, really sort of helped those skills that had nothing to do with architecture. They were all about taking an idea of something that didn't exist, whether it be a business or a real estate project that was just raw land and explaining a vision and then the technical process of how we were going to bring that vision into reality. That's really the architectural skill set. So people often think that it's about making these pretty drawings or these renderings or pulling something out of your imagination that will look amazing. That's all good too. But fundamentally, it's about this responsibility of saying, working with somebody else's money on often somebody else's land, particularly if you're doing it as a service, and saying, one, I know what it should look like and what it should be and how it should be shaped. But I also have the technical acumen to demonstrate like what materials it should be made of, how the materials are connected together. I have the project management and organizational skills to coordinate between the general contractor and their questions and concerns, the structural engineers that just want to make it work but don't really think about the broader picture. And at the same time, have the opportunity, because you don't always do this, but to take like a broader sort of cultural theme or philosophy and embed that into the physical reality. Now, that doesn't happen with all architectural projects. I mean, there's some cheesecake factories out there that are just, you know, not a lot of philosophy going into them. But that's always an option. You can elevate it more. The same way with like food or anything else. Like, you know, a ham sandwich isn't exactly cuisine, but food can be art if you actually take it in that direction and really put a lot into it. So the thing that I sort of think was critical for me was I took a few gap years. I didn't start architecture school right after high school. I I think I waited two almost, no, maybe three years before doing it. So I worked construction. I had a lot of other life experiences. And so even though I was doing an undergraduate program, I was almost the age of a young grad student. And so when I think about it now, that if you're absolutely sure you want to go right into the architecture profession where you're like, you know, you don't care so much about the financial stability. You just want to make a decent living, which you can as an architect, but you really think that it's like the right amount of like social uh, respectability that you want. You really believe it'll provide creative fulfillment and you think it'll be tons of fun and you'll have no problem motivating yourself. And you just know that architecture is the career for you. Okay. Yeah. Right out of high school, under uh, accredited undergraduate program and then you can you know intern take your test and you know start practicing if you're a little bit less sure and you kind of think like hey i kind of want to weigh all my options i kind of like it then you can do either a different on you know any sort of random undergraduate degree and then go to grad school and that's sort of a four plus three um uh, idea where You could take sort of a liberal arts sort of undergrad, uh, something in STEM, and then go to, after you get your four-year degree in something that's not architecture, art history, anything like that, then take and go into a three-year accredited architecture program. So that's sort of called an an MARC-1. I sort of did uh, the the accredited five-year undergraduate program at Cornell. And then in my third year, I sort of decided to combine it with a two-year master's degree. Um, of architecture. So that's an MR2 that goes after the sort of five-year one, but I kind of combined them all into five years to try to save money. So, um, you know, in general, I was paying by the year because of housing and the other things associated with tuition uh, cost. And I was thinking at the time, like starting to rack up quite a bit of student debt and uh, yeah, might as well, if I'm going to finish up the education, take it on to the master's so I have the option for teaching if I wanted to, uh, thought that combining those and doing some summer programs would, would keep the, the, the debt at a minimum. And by minimum, still, I ended up with about $180,000 of student loan debt. So let's get to just like the basic financials of it. Was it worth it economically? Um, I graduated with about 180,000 in student debt. Um, it's all paid off now. Took a took a while, but it wasn't too burdensome. Financially, the prospects coming out with a degree from a highly rated architecture program were were pretty good. Um, I always ended up working for myself though, and I wasn't too interested in uh, working for an architecture firm. I kind of interned. 
um, after high school and before I went for, for some architects and kind of saw a little bit behind the scenes and was pretty sure that I wanted to be leading a firm, not being a cog for a firm. So I think that's another way to sort of think about it and it should weigh into your questions is if you're going specifically and you want to have this professional degree, right? You want to get that degree so that you can then get your license and be a practicing architect. Then, yeah, the financial upside, kind of kind of minimal. You can do well, not quite as well as a lawyer, but not, not terribly. You look up. You know, you can look up kind of the average salaries and the way I, the way I would sort of do that analysis, I wouldn't look at a national average. I would look at the average for the for the program that you're getting at and also their sort of hiring rates for their recent grads. And then I would look at it, cross reference that versus what the average sort of architect salary in the city that you would like to end up living in. So I would get it very specific to your university's program. Because it's a big difference between the, the higher programs and some of the ones near more in the middle. And then the, 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 you know, the, the cities is a big difference. If you're architect, my architecture friends in New York, um, they make a lot more than my architecture friends in St. Louis or my architecture friends in uh, Colorado. Uh, but they also have higher expenses. So Factor in those things when you're factoring just that that strict sort of financial part. If you're someone that goes, that feels like they, you know, that's not enamored with the profession and is just like, hey, I want to make buildings a certain way. And you're all about sort of making buildings. And I've had a few people come up to me and being like, well, I heard that most architecture students can't design a building even after they graduate and have a master's degree or an undergraduate degree. It's true that some can't, but a lot of them can. Uh, you know, me and my classmates certainly could because we focused on that. It's just that it's more like it's not that they don't teach you that. There's tons of classes on sort of technical proficiency. Uh, structural uh, classes for architects are required. Uh, HVAC, buildings, mechanical systems are all required. Even professional practice is a required course for the five year undergraduate accredited degree. It's just that there isn't the peer pressure or kind of social kind of cachet associated with performing well in those. So it's not like a, a strict thing. Like some students took those very seriously. My, my uh, co-founding partner for Zero Energy Design, the architecture firm that I, that I founded with Stephanie Horowitz, uh, she loved those classes and me and her took those classes pretty seriously because our goal was to not work for other people and to try to figure out how to how to start our own firm. So but there isn't the same kind of like no one's coming up to you at the end of the year being like, how'd you do? in you know, people, everyone will ask, how'd you do in studio? Because um, that's sort of the big class where you're sort of presenting your creative uh, authorship. Nobody really cared. Oh, did, how did you, well, you know, what grade did you get in structures or uh, professional practice? So there's information there. It's just not necessarily there isn't this kind of social or cultural weight in the atmosphere kind of pushing uh, excellence in those subtopics as much. Um, also, we were lucky enough at Cornell to have a really strong engineering department, too. So we could kind of take specific classes in, you know, uh, in the engineering departments to really kind of develop some more sort of higher tech skills that we were hoping would make us competitive. So you can kind of shape that. But if you're just thinking like, I want to make houses and I want to make really cool houses and I don't want to deal with the esoteric or the philosophical or even like the professional parts of like architectural practice, then yeah, maybe it should, you know, might be something where you, you know, work for a general contractor that builds the type of buildings you think are cool and then learning sort of design software and hiring drafts people along the way. So if you kind of know that you want to be an architect and you want that kind of professional accreditation and the, the get your stamp and your license and all that good stuff and play that role in society, okay, probably makes sense. If you just say, I want to make really cool, sick houses uh, in this very specific environment, then yeah, getting a general contractor's license certainly a lot more expensive and saving you know 
a lot of money on tuition and a lot of time on on getting right into it uh, certainly could make sense. So to sort of summarize before we get on to some specific questions that we got, um, I would say, yeah, if you're if you know that you want to be an architect and you want to do the profession, great. But remember that the profession itself, and we'll do future videos on what it's like to be a, a working architect or a designer, and we'll probably do some interviews for that as well. You don't quite have the creative autonomy in the profession right out of school that you do in school. So school is actually the really fun because you're given these hypothetical projects that you're in complete control with. In reality, most architecture, there's exceptions, but most buildings are not designed by one person. And the bigger the building, the more people involved. And the more people involved, the less individual autonomy that you have. The bigger the building, the more the building costs to make. And there's financial pressures and all these things that impact that kind of, you know, that purity of your ability to enact and embody every part of your creative desire. So it's not a free form, creative, expressive uh, profession the way like being an artist is. It is one with a lot of constraints. Architecture is a dependent profession and it's a service. So if you kind of want to develop a very specific type of visionary building, you might want to be a developer that has some design abilities. And that's sort of where I've kind of ended up at, at this phase in my career. But in, by no means do I kind of regret the, the time or money spent on the architecture degree. In particular, there's no counterfactual, right? Like I haven't lived two lives, one where I went to USC for business and then the other one where I went to Cornell for architecture. But when... <laughs> I guess the best way to sit to, or the most tangible way I can communicate that I don't regret it is I never felt like in paying my student loan payments that like, oh, man, that was a mistake or that sucks. It all felt like, honestly, it felt worth it. Now, that might be because I have pretty minimal uh, uh, taste when it comes to sort of extravagance of spending or because I came from such like a kind of boring, mundane kind of environment that I was so grateful for all the interesting places and people that uh, I got to experience by by going to a major program and meeting kids from all over the world and then traveling in that program. So it was definitely made me sort of more, I felt culturally well-rounded and gave me a level of comfort in operating in societal situations that... Um, you know, I didn't really experience in my hometown or definitely within my kind of high school peers. That being said, when I look at kind of the kids I went to architecture undergraduate with, the kind of 70 kids in my my freshman class, I would say I have to do some additional research. But in general, I'd say probably like 40 out of the seven, 70 are practicing architects today. Um one of them, uh, some of them have, come up, have gone on to become fashion designers or successful artists. Um, some of them have gotten into tech, and digital media. Other ones have gone into real estate and other ones went on to get MBAs or degrees and then sort of uh, master's degrees in other fields. So, But for the most part, all have done pretty well. And so if it's even if it ends up not being something that you do on a day to day basis and you know, I practiced for about six or seven years with Zero Energy Design, the firm I founded, but I still use the skills I learned now. I still use the kind of, uh, I still reach out to my former classmates for creative advice and still good friends with them. And when I think of the kids that I went to high school with, with and their sort of connection to USC or UCLA or some of the other programs I was looking at for, for business or more kind of just non-specific degrees, their connection to their alma mater is one of kind of like nostalgia around partying and having a lot of fun. And I have that same inclination towards Cornell, though Cornell's not that fun. It's not much of a party school. But 
it's more I look at it as a place of like deep creative and philosophical uh, maturation and and uh, evolution for myself. So I kind of think that's the purpose of education more than the specific knowledge because. The kind of YouTubers are right. Like you can't get the specific knowledge and information anywhere, but the ability to kind of like evolve around similarly minded people um, is pretty important. And that's true even now as I do sort of digital media or real estate development. When, you know, Mike from Modern Bills and Rachel Metz are, are all kind of out and around the desert, it's it kind of feels the same way design school did like you have other people trying to do a similar thing with different perspectives you're having dinners together you're like sharing wins and losses and commiserating with things that went wrong and sharing things that you're really excited about with people that are trying to do similar things and that's energizing and the kind of cultural knowledge that kind of evolves and develop from that type of social plus kind of uh, professional pursuit interaction is just it just makes getting better at something a lot of fun at the same time all right but let's get to some specific questions so what did you learn in architecture school that made you viable for other tangential fields of work how did those credits transfer in the real world so the main thing was the ability to kind of present ideas that don't exist yet and the first time i was really tested in this was as i I did this uh, tech startup called freegreen.com and I had this idea for taking uh, for sort of digital media startup and I worked with a partnered with a, a graduate student in the MBA program at Cornell and we created a business plan and we actually won this like all Ivy League business plan competition and I sort of presented it and that was the only uh, non MBA presenting and we won we won this like this investment. And then that got us in front of a bunch of other investors and we were able to raise a bunch of money. And basically we were got an investment of like right around a million dollars for making a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and it was all about sort of the future of architecture and design and how we're going to create a digital media company. Um, we ended up sort of uh, kind of struggling after 2008. Um, with the sort of financial collapse there, our funding source uh, went under. The, the the it was sort of a sustainable fund, but we ended up sort of you know building the company back up and uh, had a very modest acquisition in around like 2013, 2014, and that's when I sort of transitioned over to YouTube and digital media. But the ability to kind of make that presentation and do it with conviction, and then also to stand out in a room full of MBAs with kind of a probably better renderings and visuals and, and stuff like that. Since you spend so much time sort of honing your graphic skills, uh, it certainly was able to compete in a business environment with people that specialized in that and not just compete, but kind of stand out. And I think a different perspective can, can be useful in doing that. So that was helpful. Um, in general, I'd say like the pace of architecture is really interesting too is, you know, in school, it's a bunch of hypothetical projects that you're rushing from one to the other. So you get really good at sort of creating physical stuff, presenting it, and then moving on. It slows down a little bit in the profession where, you know, I remember our first big architecture commission, you know, it took us about three months to kind of close the sale and get the client to sign. Then it took about like kind of six months of preliminary design work to in meeting with the client to get them excited about it. And then it took about 18 months to two years to work with the client to find the right contract and manage that, get our design through a structural engineering process, get it priced out, have to do design revisions to bring it under budget, and then finalize the design, work with the local city to get it permitted and all that kind of uh, legal stuff done. And then administering the construction, meeting, you don't just draw plans and then hand them to a builder and you're done, but actually going on site and checking to make sure that their builder is building what's in the plans. Because the architectural plans are almost a legal document that is part of the contractual agreement with the constructor uh, so that the client is actually getting what they're paying for. So 
when I look at that process, right, you know, of like a two and a half to sort of three year process to take a you know multi million dollar project from idea, working with different stakeholders, um, dealing with both a legal and governmental side as well as like a professional engineering side as well with like the the arbitrary and subjective nature of what the client wishes for this building to look like and to to feel like. Um, that's pretty good project management general experience. And my sort of conclusion from that was, oh, I like this process. I like this length. I don't think it's that dissimilar to making like a motion picture, right? If you think about it, a, a $20 million building and a $20 million movie kind of involve about the same amount of people and take about the same amount of time to sort of pull off. So I think what's fun about architecture is that I can, in my architecture career, I can actually think of those years as, oh yeah, that was, I was working on these three projects. And when I look at sort of the finished buildings in my portfolio, I kind of know what was happening during the creation of that building from a design to construction standpoint. So it's rare that you'll have like, you know, an architect that has thousands of buildings in their portfolio. Um, if they do, they're probably like kind of doing a lot of the same thing. So there are these kind of large, significant projects that take up a big part of your time. All the more reason to not get stuck designing, you know, cheesecake factories um, or, or, or strip malls or something like that, but something that you actually feel really good about. So same thing with like movies, like, you know, movie directors, it's not like they make 100 films. I mean, what Tarantino's done, like maybe he'll do 10, maybe 11, hopefully more. Um, but yeah, they, they take up big chunks. One of the things that made me sort of interested in doing what I'm doing now is you get a little bit more, you get a little bit more immediate creative benefit and reward by doing smaller projects. So when I build a piece of furniture, I can go from idea to completed uh, finished piece to edited video that's seen by a bunch of people in like one to two weeks. So I think now what I really like is not designing buildings for other people, but working on one one or two big real estate projects at a time that I'm kind of designing for myself. I still hire architects to do the, the responsibilities and take care of the drawings and project management, a lot of stuff. But I love the creative process of having a couple big projects going on consistently. But then I mix in a bunch of like sort of quick rapid fire furniture projects or sort of experimental installation pieces and things like that, or just experiments with materials. And that allows me to have sort of creative reward on like a weekly or monthly basis, but at the same time feel like I'm contributing to something more significant and of a bigger scale that will last a really long time. So yeah, I think architecture is good for all the other tangential things you could do. Um, but I think you would probably say the same thing about just anything else. Like being a good writer is good for just about everything else. Is architecture protected from automation or artificial intelligence? Should I go get an architectural degree if everything's going to be done by artificial intelligence in a few years? So artificial intelligence is going to impact every field the same way computers and internet impacted virtually every field. I don't think it gets rid of architectural jobs per se. I think it changes them. The I'm involved with a couple AI startups in the design field. Skip is the, the main one. I've done videos on that. But I think there's this mistake that people think they're paying the architect for a set of drawings. Like they're, like they're commissioning a custom suit. Like, okay, I want a building with a living room here and a dining room here and a kitchen open concept to here and so on. And then you, the architect makes the drawings and the client says, yes, change this. And then they're done. Now, in most professions, you're paying not so much for labor. You're paying for someone to take responsibility within a professional context. So for the hotel that I'm working on now, we hired an architecture firm. And they're responsible for coordinating all the notes from the engineers the, the utility companies, the general contractor, um, we're working with some prefab companies, this, so the prefab manufacturers, and taking all those thoughts and considerations about the technical details and the aesthetic vision of the whole project 
and making sure all of that is represented into a drawing set that's over 100 pages of 42 inch by 36 inch paper. The drawing set is huge. It costs like $200 to print one of these. So it's not just where the floor plan is and you know, oh, here's the structural analysis. It is a business proposal embedded into paper with coordination from all these different disciplines. And then also the, the client, in this case, me and my business partners are our dreams and wishes as well. So you pay for responsibility and we have artificial intelligence that's very good at removing certain parts of the labor change, like renderings. Renderings will probably get easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper. But somebody still has to put the inputs into the rendering and someone still has to present an aesthetic or a taste that will work well for the goals of that project. So there's still editors and curation and control and responsibility that's needed. I think it'll just be less tedious labor. Now, I actually think that makes architecture a more desirable career, not a less desirable career. Because a lot of entry-level architecture positions right out of school is you're detailing fire stairs. That's like the joke. So if you're designing like how, you know, you know, high-rise housing, back in the day with 2D AutoCAD before Revit and the 3D models, you know, a junior level draft person have to kind of go in and do every single drawing sheet to make sure that all the fire stairs line up, show the exact railing detail and all those kind of things. That's a lot of graphic and tedious work that is not really about vision. It's much more about like technical implement implementation graphically. So I think the, the AI will reduce a lot of those labor tasks. But what we're a very, very long ways away is from the actual sort of philosophical and creative direction role, and then also the project management uh, responsibility. So, you know, until we have artificial responsibility, the top jobs will be pretty safe. Now, would I start a firm that does renderings now? <laughs> mm, probably not, unless I was really on the cutting edge of using the software and could undercut a lot of the existing firms. For context, technology shifts are a huge advantage for younger people. So we launched our architecture firm in around 2006. And Revit, which is the 3D model version of Autodesk AutoCAD, was pretty new. And a lot of residential architecture firms weren't really using it yet. So we built our firm around technology that was pretty new, BIM, or Building Information Modeling. And we can incorporate energy modeling, and we're really marketing towards like green and sustainable design. And we had in-house engineers that could do all these calculations to prove that the additional insulation and things we were doing were going to lower your utility bills. So even though we did had no experience against the people we were competing with in the residential architecture uh, market of kind of the New England area, mostly Boston to Cape Cod, a little bit of New York, we could compete on a technological basis that a lot of firms with 10 to 20 years of experience were not even close to integrating. So young people tend to be good at the newer technology. So we used Revit or building information modeling as a competitive advantage to elevate our careers faster and outcompete older, more experienced firms that had bigger portfolios. I think there's an opportunity for college grads now or kids in college to get really good at generative AI and going to clients saying, hey, this you know experienced firm, they have a lot more experience in architecture. They have a complete portfolio of built work. But ask them how many renderings of their kitchen. Are they going to show you renderings of every single room in your house? Will they offer you unlimited sort of feedback and switching and changing? Will you get complete animation walkthroughs? A skilled student that knows how to prompt AI and to load up some models so it's more kind of three-dimensionally accurate and not just like, you know, pixelated renderings um, will have an advantage. It doesn't mean they'll win every commission, but they have a shot at beating out with that specific leveraged technology, more experienced firms that maybe just haven't been playing around with that stuff as much. So um, for young people... AI will probably be an advantage for sort of skipping the line if they sort of get into it. And just remember, you get really paid, you get paid the small bucks for your brute force labor. You get paid the big dollars for your judgment um, and for taking responsibility of taking a whole bunch of things that somebody else wants 
and packaging them all up, synthesizing them together and creating sort of a cohesive package that gets the project done. In today's economy, is there more opportunity in the architecture job market or more opportunity in architectural entrepreneurship carving your own path? Well, I mean, entrepreneurship, you, you look, in America, you get paid not for how hard you work. You get paid for taking risk that you get lucky enough that pays off. You get paid for bets that you win. So the upside is entrepreneurship. The stability is in high quality professionalism. So, you know, if I would have stayed on at my architecture firm that I co-founded, like everyone there gets paid pretty well. Like it, it does well, but you're not going to have years where, you know, you make an extraordinary amount of money. You're not going to hit these sort of financial home runs. You'll see this like slow, steady progression. And then you'll start to make decisions about, okay, do we want to make 20% more money this year? Or do we want to maybe have better quality of life as people start to have families and stuff like that? So within the profession, if you do a good job and kind of have a good team around you, you can do quite well. Um, but it's not like you're going to have these like windfall years necessarily. Whereas with sort of real estate development, you know, one project, super stressful, took three years, a lot of risk, felt like it maybe took years off my life. But the financial sort of results from that were probably bigger than any sort of four or five year stretch I could do at my architecture firm. So with you get paid for risk um, and you get paid for risk that works out in your favor. So I think you can kind of mix and match uh, as needed. In terms of the architectural job market, uh, yeah, I think there's always responsibility needed in the built environment. If you look right now at what's happening in commercial real estate, particularly office buildings, there's so many vacant office buildings in cities. The prices will probably have to come down a lot, and it's not easy to convert office space into residential towers. But as the prices continue to drop, they'll start to be more and more initiative into that and that's like a huge, huge pipeline. If you take a place like San Francisco or even New York to some degree, and each one of those mostly empty office towers, eventually the price will come low enough. And unless there's a big change of people going back into the offices, which looks unlikely, um, you're going to slowly start to see a lot of that stuff converted. So there's always shifts in society that need a response in the built environment. And yeah, that's why they'll always be, will need professionals that can take responsibility to get projects done. As an aspiring architect, what software is the best to learn? What software is outdated? And what best serves architects these days? Okay, so the first 3D modeling software I used or I learned was Form Z, which is more of an industrial design software. Like nobody uses it anymore. It was not uncommon in 2002, um, but not competitive with anything else and probably would have been better spent learning Grasshopper or Maya or just focusing on Fusion. So in general, Autodesk is the Adobe of architecture software. So by far the kind of software leader in building and construction and architecture. And whenever there's kind of like a clever startup, like there was, I think Revit wasn't created by Autodesk. It was created by some other group and then Autodesk acquired it and integrated it. Um, Autodesk has a ton of money and they have like a kind of a clear lead financially. With AI, there could be some disruption, and I'm certainly involved with some very specific niche design software companies like Skip, uh, which is focusing just on kitchen renovations. But if any of them become big enough to where they're the point of competition for Autodesk, there's a good chance Autodesk will kind of gobble it up. Um, the same way you saw sort of Adobe uh, purchase, uh, uh, was it Figma, I think it was, or one of the, the other kind of like interface design companies. So the safest thing to do is to learn any of the Autodesk softwares. Now, tinkering around in Revit is not very fun. Uh, it's not a very creative software. It's a very technically proficient and deeply capable uh, building modeling interface. 
And so if you're just making aesthetic renderings, you know, Maya or Rhino or some of these things are a lot more freeform and you can kind of sculpt with a lot more kind of precision and without the kind of uh, automated capabilities of Revit. So if you want to be valuable as a potential employee to hire, it's Autodesk all the way. If you want to kind of expand your creative vision into sort of 3D printing buildings or like cnc you know, interior design pieces, then, you know, maybe Fusion, which is also Autodesk or, you know, some of these other more uh, Rhino or Mayas or more sort of responsive 3D modelers might be better for you. So if you think that you're going to be more hands on and eventually end up in the more kind of artsy furniture building, occasionally do a building, but a lot of interior work, build, cut and install it yourself. Yeah, I think any sort of 3D modeling that you feel really expressive in is probably the best bet. But if you want to play in the profession um, and at the highest level of working for the bigger firms, then yeah, probably Revit and the full Autodesk suite is your best bet. So for today, I really just wanted to cover the question of architectural education. I think in future episodes, we'll dive into kind of early career challenges and some of the things that worked for me and some of the things that didn't. Um, but I think the young professional section of architecture is a whole topic unto itself. I think we'll probably also do another Q&A session kind of around design school in general. There's some overlaps with architecture school versus design schools, um, but I think there's some there's enough to kind of be applied broadly, and I'll probably bring in some guests for interviews on those topics. In general, with this channel is... I finally think that there's, I get a lot of questions. I don't answer a lot of questions in the main sort of homemade modern videos and occasionally I answer a DM on Instagram, which you should follow. But I think I'm at the phase now where I have enough perspective where I actually feel comfortable and confident sort of sharing it. Um, and more importantly, there's also the ability now to build a body of work of how I think and respond to questions and I really like the idea of building my own large language uh, model so that I can automate this and also talk to myself. I think that's uh, a pretty cool way to scale your own sort of creative thought process. So all those things have sort of led to the motivation to uh, create a talking show. So on this channel, what you'll see is we'll do a lot of Q&As like this. So that means questions, put them in the comment section below. Um, this is produced by Shane, my longtime uh, creative partner and camera person and editor. He'll be sort of packaging it up and going through those questions and serving them up. I kind of don't like seeing them too far in advance because I think off the cuff is a little better. And yeah, they can be on any sort of topic. So the things I feel pretty confident talking about are architecture, design, digital media, Small-scale entrepreneurship. I am not the person to tell you how to get rich because it's, well, one, why? Um, and two, it's like that, that kind of advice is there's plenty of people doing it. Um, but I do feel comfortable sort of, you know, leaning on my past and kind of explaining what kind of creative projects have been both rewarding financially and then also sort of rewarding from a sort of creative uh, standpoint as well. So uh, small scale entrepreneurship, how to build your own first home. Um, I think that's a really fun topic is I think we'll do a whole series on how to turn raw land into a nice house. Uh, I've done that a few times now in three different locations and pretty soon a fourth. Um, Digital media stuff again. I'm no Mr. Beast or 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 you know Colin Smear are pretty good at that from a broad standpoint, but specifically on how to sort of translate a creative profession or pursuit like art, design, or architecture into some sort of social media following. I think I got a little bit of insight there. And the other thing we'll probably do here is share some of my more abstract building experiments. So. Homemade Modern is where I show a lot of the sort of finished DIY to woodworking to construct, uh, well, light construction renovation projects. The Modern Home Project is where I show my complete ground up build. It's like the shipping container house. Go check that out if you haven't seen that. We built the shipping container start to, start to finish in Joshua Tree. 
But there's a lot of other things that I do in the workshop where I'm testing materials and I don't really share those on Homemade Modern because they don't always result in a project, but I think they might be interesting to showcase on this channel. So subscribe if you're so inclined, load up your questions in the comment section below. And in the future, we might try to set up some more kind of interactive stuff as well. Um, but yeah, this, I think the main goal is to, to build a database of my answers so that we can uh, provide those answers at scale um, in the future. Thanks for watching. Bye.